I was raised as a gift to the god in the mountains. Last summer, I was chosen to die. All the unmarried women in our town are born with the potential to be given to the hill father, as we've called our god since our people first settled in this land. Three times a decade, the ancestress, an old woman named Elka, who many think a witch, climbs the mountain to ask the hill father to name who he'll take from us. We of the town below weep, and we wait and shudder in dread that our blood will be that which the old god craves. Then Elka returns and goes to the chosen girl to take her hand and without a word, declares the hill father's choice. Many times I've seen those hapless women scream out, or fall howling to their knees, begging for another to be taken in their places. But always those women go with Elka to the mountain, and from it they never return. Before the events, I'm to tell, none of us knew what it was the hill father did with his gifts. All that we beheld was that, on the night of offering, the wind that passed through the forests on high sounded like screams to us. No one living but Elka had seen the god, though we'd all felt and heard him walk in steps like thunder through the mountain. It was Elka's ancestor, or some say she herself, old then and ancient now, that first met the hill father and heard him speak of his desires. An unmarried girl he must take for the birth, maturity, and death knoll of a decade, and in return, we that trespassed on his domain would find our lives there prosperous. This the old woman told the settling families, but none of them believed her addled and superstitious as she seemed, even to those who still held pagan beliefs. When the day came that the first maiden was called for, the god's demands were ignored. That night the mountain shook with falling stones and fire, shaking down roofs upon livestock and killing some of those that had denied the hill father his toll. Some great thing moved in the forests above, it's told, a bulk of sticks and shadow. Still, the settlers did not provide. Many attempted to flee the mountain to settle elsewhere, but were prevented by another storm so unnatural in its fury as to be understood as the weapon of a vengeful god. In terror, the people returned to their settlement, and so resigned to the giving of their daughters, the first of which the old woman that night bore away. The animals reared upon the land grew strong and hale, as did the crops fed from that generous mountain. In time, the hill father allowed some of the settlers to travel as far as the neighboring town of Walpurgis to sell what they had sown, and from this those families came into wealth such as they had never known in the country they'd left behind. Technology and industry came to us, also vehicles, computers, and telephones. As with the visits to Walpurgis, all within the bounds of our community were forbidden to speak of our pact with the hill father by any means, nor were our men permitted to lure strange women into town to exchange for their blood. This Elka, as mouthpiece to the god, commanded, and so in spite of such advances and communication with the outer world, the cause of our riches remained a secret, a bleak and festering shame. As bitter as it was to part with their women, our menfolk came to see it as a worthy price. They put forth many daughters and loved them less than their sons, so as not to grieve so dearly 
if they were given away. Their wives, too, became heart of heart, for being exempt through marriage of being taken, they soon forgot their fear of the God. Their daughters were kept in locked rooms, under close watch, or else flanked by guards about their chores, only their favorites allowed to marry and so escape the hill father's hunger. Had the girls been permitted the freedoms of sons, they would have surely spoiled their chances with intent until not a girl was left there, but those that were still children and not yet grown into the tastes of the God. Thus as prisoners, we girls have been raised across the centuries, knowing our fate is but two paths, to wed and breed, and so continue the tradition, or else to disappear into the forests above, and be the reason for our town's continued wealth. I've lived a life of dread since birth, of sleepless nights, praying with cold hands to be spared when the next night of choosing came. As a youth I survived it, and watched with a harrowed gladness as another was led into the woods on the hill. But when, this year, Elka passed through the waiting crowd to take my hand, I felt fear sing through my very bones until I fell loose into her arms. My two younger sisters carried me home, their faces torn between the relief of their survival and the loss of me to the mountain. They looked at me and whispered amongst themselves as they went about the housework, and in their eyes I saw the same terror I felt in my own hopeless soul. My father didn't take well to my choosing. He wasn't so hard as other men, being that my mother had died giving birth to me, a misfortune almost unknown to our folk who took pride in their God-given vigor. The loss had driven my father into a cynical depression, and knowing that he was to have the remnant of his first wife, seized from him only drove him further into that mire of sadness. So it was that I found him, that afternoon, sprawled across a chair with his head in his hands, his gaunt features torn through with wretchedness. Being that his second wife, my stepmother, was visiting friends, and my sisters toiled busily at work, there was no one left to console him through this new grief, but I, gently, I sat beside him, concealing the shake in my arms as I held him to me. Oh, Dad, I said, I just can't help thinking about Irma and Alina. They're so young. I don't know how they're going to take it when I'm gone. I know. My father groaned, rubbing a hand across his brow. Hell, I know. I always hoped somehow we'd lost enough, that the Hill Father would see that and spare our family after what we've given away. Your mother? Now my little girl, I can't take it. I just can't. He sat up sharply, fixing me with watering eyes. Don't tell a word of this to anyone, he said suddenly, but I heard there are a couple of families over the years who've made a deal with the ancestress. Gone up to see her, buttered her up, convinced her to, well, commune with the hill father and ask him to pick somebody else. She'd just tell people he changed his mind, that the girl was no good, unworthy. You remember Emery, don't you? Emery, I repeated. You mean the girl everybody was saying snuck off with boys and ruined herself? They say she ran off to Walpurgis out of shame. Her folks sent her off there, my father said. Married her to some poor kid last minute and got her out of town as quick as they could. They go out to see her now and then. Figured the stain on their family 
and all the pointed fingers and accusations of them not doing their bit was worth keeping her. And now I'm sitting here thinking the same about you. He squeezed my hand in his, so chilled despite the summer balm of the day that I gasped aloud. You do that for me, I asked softly. Are you sure, Dad? We'll go tonight, he said. I'll slaughter our best pig and take Elky the meat. They say the ancestress won't take money. Still stuck in the old ways, I guess. I just pray she'll help us. Word is, she's turned plenty of folks away. Before now. God knows why. It was around midnight when my father and I went up to see the ancestress, panting and staggering through the dark under the weight of the dead sow. Elkie lived in a cabin at the perimeter of the forest, kept company by three wolf dogs that seemed to have been living there for almost as long as she had. The dogs watched, silent, as we approached, their shaggy figures gargoyle-like in the cloistered shadow of the house. My father knocked, dropping the pig in its crimson sack upon the porch. I could smell the fear in his sweat, or else my own. We were all of us in holy awe of the ancestress, being that it was said she held the power to free or condemn any that lived in the town below with a word in the hill father's ear. Five minutes passed before she came to the door, searching the night with eyes as black as coins, aged at the bottom of a well. Old as she was, the woman was still broad and strong, her frame hardened into muscularity from a life spent toiling in the woods. Aside from her appointed ceremonies, Elka was rarely seen in the town below and accepted audience only from those that couldn't seek counsel elsewhere. The stained copper of her eyes moved from me to my father with suspicion, falling at last to the gift oozing fresh blood upon the porch. Her scrutiny passed a shudder through me, like a huntsman's knife, all winter silver, and suddenly I believed that she had been made a witch or otherwise inhuman through the hill father's influence. I see, said the ancestress, shortly. Another one. Well then. Her voice was deep, thickly accented with the German that was our town's beginning. Ancestress? My father began, uncertainly. The old woman cut him off. Go home. Come back in the morning. Then you'll know my answer to you. I began to retreat with him, halted only by another blunt command. You stay. In a panic, I glanced at my father, but he was quite drunk with terror and as useless as a child. He stood, swaying, breathing thickly through his open mouth. He would be hated, a pariah, if the town learned he meant to give another's daughter, in my place. This we both knew, but what guilt either of us felt then was eaten up by our desperation to preserve my own life. It's all right, I said. Go home. I love you, Dad. I love you too. I watched my father totter back through the night, muttering and jumping at shapes in the darkness. The ancestress cleared her throat. I'm sorry, I said, and leaned down to help her carry the pig into the house. To my surprise, she hoisted the weight alone, and without complaint, the confident roll of her shoulders, implying an accustomed ease to the burden. The cabin was scarcely lit, comprised of primitive rooms with few markers of the current year, save for a few basic appliances. The air within smelled of damp earth and gamey meat, and beneath that, the musky stink of dog. 
I sat pensively on a kitchen chair as Elka loaded the pig's remains into a freezer, her flat, androgynous features without discernible expression. At last she said, Yes, I will help you, but you'll have to do everything I tell you to. Thank you, I said, with the eagerness of relief. Yes, thank you. The ancestress turned to wash her hands at a nearby sink, blood and dirt mixing in the drain. Presently, she said, First, I'll show you something in the forest. You'll see what happens to the girls out here. My fear returned at once, corroding me with a heat that was almost cold. Why do I have to see? I asked. What if I don't want to know? Elke turned to stare at me, and hers were a bear's eyes of the same uncomprehending animal darkness. I'm sorry, I said again. Please, show me. I followed the ancestress into the forest, noting that the three wolf dogs came with us no further than the first mile beyond the tree line. Elka found her way through the dark by way of an old-fashioned lantern, though from the certain tread of her boots I imagined she'd know her way just as well without. Her sturdy shape was like a trundling stone against the forest, only marked as human by the clothes on her back. Every step I took at her heels was grudging and unstable with fear. None of us from town dared enter the forest in which the hill father lived, having heard enough stories of his cantankerous awakenings to value our skins over any curious venture. Even had I not known these tales, I would have felt from the very air of that place that I was not wanted there. Each sound and small motion in the trees was hostile, of that I was certain. I thought of the storms that had shaken the settling families, the wandering colossus that had been seen in the woods above. I walked as close to the ancestress as I dared, holding the lamp she had given me as though coveting a jewel. Stop, said Elka, at last. Over there. This is where I find them, the women. After the hill father is done with them, I looked past her thick shoulder into a clearing some feet away, raising my lamp to join hers in drowning the space in light. We stood together for some time, she in plain-faced duty and I rigid with shock. How they die I can't tell you, said Elka. I leave the chosen girls far from here, in another place, where the hill father takes them from me. He moves fast, too fast for me to follow him. I don't know what he does to them, only what they are when he is finished. Between the trees were rows of skeletons planted upright, as though having sprung up like grass in natural growth. The bones had been tampered with, the skulls elongated and deformed into tortured instruments, through which the breeze played in a music like screams. The hill father had made toys of our women, wind chimes grotesque and beautiful, in the new shapes his will had worn them into. For this petty sport I was to be sacrificed, to be some object to amuse, where before I'd served and obeyed. As I stood, gaping in a fixation of horror, I was tortured with the belief that the women were each still alive, in some fashion, their souls caught in nets of broken bone. Why does he do this? I asked at last. Why only women? What does it matter? The ancestress shrugged her shoulders, and I comprehended that she was neither indifferent nor cold, as I'd first thought, only numbed with her own desolate fear. I have asked him that myself, said Elka, 
he won't tell me, because he has watched people, I think, and learned to know them. He knows women are already traded in other ways. He knows he can ask this from men. But it is not always easy to understand him. He doesn't speak with words. Elke turned her head away from me, and when she spoke again, there was a weariness in her of centuries enslaved. His voice is like wind or stones. I understand him enough to seize a name, a feeling, yes or no. That is all. What is he? I asked, in a sort of breathless awe. The ancestress shrugged again. A man, a forest, a creature, so old that he remembers when people first came here, when there were only animals on the mountain. He walks on all fours like a beast himself, but sometimes he is wind, stone, fire as well. The mountain is part of him, I think, and if we leave him or do not serve him, he'll kill us all and start again when other people come. I believed it. The forest seemed to listen to the old woman's words. Does the hill father know we're here? I asked in quivering trepidation. The ancestress nodded. Yes, I froze. Had I been tricked? Lured here to gift to the god a day earlier than agreed? It's all right, said Elka, sensing my fright even without turning to look me in the face. He won't come near us. He'll only take tomorrow. He has his rules. Doesn't he care that I've seen this? I asked. Isn't he angry or afraid? No. What does a god like him have to fear from you? Then the ancestress beckoned me to follow her through the forest again. My fear still had not left me, for I did not trust the hill father, as she did, and half believed he'd come to claim me through the trees. In the morning, you will be married, Elka told me, as we descended the mountain. That is the one sure way to be safe. Ritual. Ceremony. The Hill Father understands this. Then why doesn't every girl get married? I asked, desperately, already knowing the answer. Wouldn't that stop this? The ancestress looked back over her shoulder, and her bear's eyes stared into me with the memory of an old and endless torment. He would ask to be offered something else, she said. Men, perhaps children, he would plant a new forest of bones. And if we didn't agree, we would all die, the way people did when they last said no to the god. She turned her back again, and behind us, I was sure I felt the weight of some shambling Goliath, pacing the shadows at our heels. You will be married, said Elka once more. There is a young man that will agree to this, if I ask him. You will both go away from here, to the other town, where the mountain begins to lose its hold, to others. Others? I repeated. That is not your business. Yours is to live. The ancestress stopped in her tracks and held up the lantern so as to look deep into my eyes. There is one more thing I must ask she said. Can you send another here to die? I paused, and there was only the beat of my sickened heart and her guttural breaths to be heard in the forest before I gave my answer. The following morning, I wed a boy I barely knew, and with my father's blessing. I went to the young man's door with the ancestress at my side drawing him, dull-eyed, from his bed to ask him for his hand. Emile had lost three sisters to the hill father's collection, and was young enough that he was not yet cold to their fate, as so many of the townsmen had learned to be. 
Some months after the last of his siblings was sent to the mountain, Emil had gone to the ancestress to beg her favor as I had. I'm not made for this place, he'd told her. Will you ask the hill father to let me leave unharmed? Elka had thought on it a day before the boy received his answer. Wait a while, young man. There's purpose for you here. This Emil told me, thin and soft-spoken in his empty, beautiful house, and I unburdened myself of my tale in return. As he listened, I saw his face pale through the horrors of the mountain, as though it drank from him all blood and coloring, until he was like bone. So it was that we were married, quickly and with scarce ceremony, and I lay with him in his bed to seal the ritual before noon broke upon the hills. Afterwards I began to weep, first from relief and then over the pity in his eyes. It was for our freedom alone the young man had consented to have me. We were but strangers to one another, joined by rings and now by the name we shared like a bitter kiss. There would never be love in our house. We had each lost too much. Elka went again to the mountain that day and asked for another name in substitute for mine. I watched a neighbor's daughter weep and stare upon my beer-ringed hand with hatred. Loathing of my choice weighed on me like a tablet of stone, but I said nothing did nothing but pack my bags to move into the faraway house that was to be bought with my new husband's money. The hill father will never have any daughter of mine, for I cannot bear children. I rid my womb of that hope as quickly as could be done by the doctors here in Walpurgis. It may be true that the hill father's desires cannot root beyond the mountain, but I dared take no chances, for I fear that monster and its capricious designs more than death in its barbarity. My husband weeps for his sisters when he thinks himself alone, but I can't bring myself to comfort him. I've only ever lost my mother, the first woman to have died for me, and of the second, and all those others buried on the mountain I don't dare grieve, having cursed one of their number to the end that I have fled from. As for the living girls I've left behind me, I pray that they are spared the greed of men and gods, or else that they are loved by their fathers, as I am by my own. <laughs>